Mr. Gladstone's government, 1880 to 1885. After an election is won, the breathless days or weeks of government making follow. Chamberlain and Dilk, like many rising and sympathetic young allies before and since, made a compact. Unless at least one of them was in the cabinet, neither would join the government. Unlike many such another compact before and since, this one stood the strain. They transmitted their terms through Harcourt, the new Home Secretary. On 26th of April, Gladstone encountered by offering Dilk Jr. office and merely hinting to him that Chamberlain might get the same. Nothing doing. The Prime Minister tried likewise with Chamberlain. Nothing doing again. So the Prime Minister capitulated. He made Chamberlain President of the Board of Trade and Dilk thereupon settled for Under Secretary for Foreign Affairs. As often, Gladstone may have been more worldly wise than magnanimous. Junior though Chamberlain was, he had been largely instrumental in the grand old man's comeback. Moreover, he controlled the effective liberal machine and represented a huge radical following, which would be more important still once the franchise, as foreshadowed, was extended. Better than in than out, caged than loose. So Chamberlain, less than four years in Parliament and less than 44 years old, was a cabinet minister. And that in a cabinet, except for Bright and Forster, of Whig lords and commoners. At this point, I am compelled to resort to that device, most reprehensible in a historian, of deserting chronology so as to follow Chamberlain's career in the cabinet, first of all leaving out Ireland, and then, over again, leaving out everything else. The necessity is that Ireland leads straight to the pivotal point in Chamberlain's life. The excuse is that Ireland largely was a thing apart and was so apprehended by the actors. By his entry into the cabinet, Chamberlain was precipitated at once into the whole range of the political questions and decisions of the country and the empire. A minister outside the cabinet can, indeed must, concentrate above all upon his department. But a cabinet minister has only the choice of being a non-entity or else applying his mind and his advice to every successive issue which comes before the government. For Chamberlain there was no question which it had to be, his abilities and personality apart. As representative of the radical element on which the government and its majority depended, his voice had to be heard on every issue. Ironically, though he plunged, as every new minister does, with zest into management and affairs of his own department, Ireland and the other great matters which demanded his attention denied the Board of Trade both parliamentary time and publicity for almost three years. Gladstone's colonial secretary, Lord Kimberley, was in the Lords. By one of the premonitory strokes of fortune which occur at intervals along Chamberlain's path, he was nominated to be the senior spokesman in the Commons. The Liberal Party had been opposed to the continued annexation of the Transvaal, none more than Chamberlain, albeit with prophetic proviso, unless some unforeseen circumstances lead to a large immigration of Englishmen. When the government hesitated, for the sake of the natives, to act accordingly on entering office, he took the rebellious step of declining to vote against a private member's motion to reduce the High Commissioner's salary at the end of a debate on the policy of annexation. After the military defeat inflicted by the Boers at Majuba Hill in February 1881, Chamberlain was one of those who enforced and defended the decision to give the Transvaal independence, though fatefully British sovereignty in external affairs was maintained. The applause for Chamberlain's defence of withdrawal from the Transvaal and the House of Commons had scarcely died away in the summer of 1881 when it was renewed by his, his rebuttal of a motion warning against a reactionary and protectionist commercial treaty with France, another event which cast a long shadow forward. The people of this country, the mover said, are beginning to ask themselves whether a policy of admitting without question Whatever comes from abroad freely when our exports are heavily taxed in those countries is a sound and profitable one. The preoration of Chamberlain's reply was stirring. A tax on food would raise the price of every article produced in the United Kingdom and it would indubitably bring about the loss of the, that gigantic export trade which the industry and energy of the country, working under conditions of absolute freedom, has been able to create. But the speaker's inner certainties did not match his language. Dilk, in negotiation with the French Republic, attempting to reverse the principles of the Empire's Treaty of 1860 with Cobden, 
noted that Chamberlain held in a still stronger form his own views in favour of retaliatory tariffs, for example on wine, counterbalanced by lower duties on Italian and colonial produce. A few months later, Dilk reported his friend as arguing that there was a chance that some day there would be formed a British Zollverein, raising discriminating duties upon foreign produce as against that of the British Empire. Chamberlain's horizons were expanding explosively, and in the winter of 1881-82, to events in another quarter, Egypt, had opened him to other unexpected vistas. When Arabi Pasha, through the Egyptian army, made himself master of the Khedive Tufik and of Egypt at the end of 1881, Chamberlain opposed the joint note from Britain and France announcing that they would restore the Khedive's authority and thus secure the income of the European holders of the Egyptian bonds. But when the Anglo-French fleet at Alexandria unsupported by a landing force, produced anti-European riots there, Chamberlain supported the decision to bombard, upon which Bright resigned. That was the 11th of July, 1882. The step once taken, an army was dispatched which defeated al Arabi et Telel Kabir on the 13th of September and made Britain mistress of Egypt. Chamberlain told the House of Commons that it had been their duty to interfere, but for the sole purpose of putting down the revolt and liberating the national sentiment. In a public meeting at the end of the year, though still expecting and representative institutions would be established in Egypt, evacuated in a year or two at the outside, he discovered that he had always protested in the strongest terms against the policy of non-intervention, and always thought that a great nation could not wrap itself up in a policy of selfish isolation and say that nothing concerned it unless its material interests were directly attacked. The session of 1883 was the first in which the Board of Trade at last got a serious share of parliamentary time. After slipping through a measure in 1882 permitting local authorities to municipalise, directly or in reversion, the generation of electricity, Chamberlain passed in parallel in 1883 both the Bankruptcy Act giving the Board of Trade supervisory and administrative functions, and the Patents Act, creating a new office for the cheap and efficient recording and protection of inventions. These were uncontroversial compared with the Merchant Shipping Bill of 1884, designed to prevent the scandalous over-insurance of unseaworthy cargo ships and thus reduce the high loss of life through wreck. By opposition, it was such that, working under the procedures of the day, so much more favourable To obstruction and delay, the bill, not being central to the government's programme, was abandoned and reform had to wait for several years. Chamberlain at one point was with difficulty dissuaded by the Prime Minister from riding for a fall and resigning, because when Jonah had been thrown to the whale, the gale raised by the shipowners would abate. The class overtones of the opposition to the merchant shipping bill had an unmistakable connection with the two other internal issues. Ireland always apart, dominated Chamberlain's attention for the rest of the Parliament. The debates on the Third Reform Bill, which extended household franchise to the counties, ran parallel to Merchant Shipping Bill in the session of 1884. The attempt to exclude Ireland from it was defeated in May. In July, the Lords rejected the bill on the grounds that redistribution of seats must be simultaneous with extension of the franchise. Chamberlain launched into the Peers Against the People campaign, with riotous meetings and personal exchanges of threats and ribaldries between himself and Lord Salisbury, and came near to demanding a fight to the finish with the Upper House. In the event, a concordat on the basis of simultaneous redistribution on single-member constituencies enabled the reformed franchise to pass by the end of 1884. The year 1885, correctly expected to be election year, opened with the first pronouncement of what was to be Chamberlain's unauthorised programme, an articulated and consecutive exposition of radical social objectives which, as he was a cabinet minister, could not but dictate the ground of the coming contest of the new franchise and constituencies. The instrument was a series of speeches at intervals of two or three weeks, which progressed from the ransom that wealth ought to pay for security, to compulsory acquisition of land, manhood suffrage and graduated taxation. A cabinet minister using this instrument is irresistible except by expulsion. How many other politicians would have made use of it since uh, have assured their leaders retrospectively? 
as Chamberlain did Gladstone, and equally sincerely, that, had it been possible for me to submit to you beforehand the speeches that I have recently delivered, I would have readily cancelled any part of them, as Chamberlain wrote in, on the 3rd of February, 1885. But, as both writers and recipients know, that is not the point. If the speaker stays in, he will be master. And Chamberlain was still in when a snap defeat of the government on a finance bill amendment on the 8th and uh, 9th of June. eighteen eighty five extended the Liberal administration. Not without the sword of the Irish nationalists thrown into the scale. It was, however, at external events which gave the Gladstone government its death wish and the experience of those events had worked a chemical change in Chamberlain's outlook on Britain and the world ever since 1883. They had, in a phrase, made him a radical imperialist. In 1883, Chamberlain had been among those who had been profoundly moved by Seeley's expansion of England. Indeed, it was because Seeley's chair was at Cambridge, and he chose that university for his son Austin, born 1863. The rebellion of the Mahdi, had caught Britain, still responsible for Egypt, and therefore uh, the Egyptian garrisons in the Sudan. It was to organise their extrication that the government impulsively dispatched Gordon, who was invested in Khartoum by March 1884. Then, for five fatal months, they shrank from the necessity of an expedition to rescue him, and when at last they recognised it, they decided upon a full-scale campaign under Wolseley, which arrived two days too late, in January 1885. The impression of this catastrophe, for which he bore his share of the responsibility, was deepened in Chamberlain by the simultaneous annexation by Bismarck's Germany of the Cameroons in July 1884. Quote, I was much surprised as you are, end quote, said Lord Kimberley. And of New Guinea in December. It was on Chamberlain's insistence that the Boers were driven back out of Buchanan land, into which they had been infiltrated at the end of 1884. And a Cape politician, one Merriman, communicated to the world through the Pall Mall Gazette. For December, his prayer that before long Mr. Chamberlain might become Secretary of State for the Colonies. It was an augury which Chamberlain is known to have noted. Chapter 5. Parnell. The ingredient artificially withdrawn from the narrative of Chamberlain's five years in Gladstone's cabinet must now be replaced. For throughout those years in Parliament and in government, Ireland interwove itself with almost all the other events. The Irish thread in them has a curiously symmetric pattern. A coercion bill for Ireland was awaiting the Liberal cabinet on its entry into office. Coercion fell to be renewed in the summer of 1885. Twice in the intervening five years, Chamberlain entered into negotiation at second hand with Parnell to achieve what he supposed could be a final solution of the Irish problem, and twice in circumstances which at the time cast doubt upon Parnell's good fate, the negotiation found it. The Liberal government allowed the Conservative Peace Preservation Act to expire on the 1st of June 1880 and proceeded to attempt to deal by conciliation with the Irish discontent which showed an agrarian face. A compensation for disturbance bill, pushed through by the Commons by Forster, the new Chief Secretary, with the warm approval of Chamberlain and Dilk, was thrown out in August by the House of Lords. Chamberlain proposed forthwith an extensive programme of public works, and under threat of resignation by Chamberlain and Dilk, the Queen's speech in January 1881, while calling for renewed and indeed intensified coercion, promised county boards and land reform. In Ireland, the Land League and boycott threatened the collapse of civil government. In Parliament, as soon as it resumed, the Nationalists under Parnell destroyed by unprecedented obstruction the old conventions of the House of Commons. By the end of the session, the Land Bill, our message of peace to the Irish people, Chamberlain called it in a Birmingham speech, had passed into law. But its acceptance as such was the last thing desired by Parnell, who inflamed the agitation and violence, courted his arrest, detention in modern parlance and committal to Kilmainham Jail on the 13th of October, 1881. He was released on parole, ostensibly to visit a dying relative. 
On 10th of April 1882 and on 15th of April, purporting to act on his behalf, the MP for Clare, Captain O'Shea, whose wife was Parnell's mistress and had already borne him a child, wrote to Gladstone and Chamberlain simultaneously proposing negotiation. Chamberlain sought and obtained Gladstone's and then the cabinet's permission to proceed upon his personal responsibility. The outlines were rapidly agreed between O'Shea and Chamberlain. In exchange for a measure compulsorily extinguished arrears of rent, Parnell would advise tenants to resume paying rent and would denounce all forms of law-breaking. Declining an extension of parole, Parnell had returned to Kilmainham on the 24th of April. O'Shea visited him there and returned on the 30th of April to place in the hands of Chamberlain and Forster what purported to be a letter to himself from Parnell which was to be known as the Kilmainham Treaty. It was placed before the cabinet. Parnell and one or two other detainees were released unconditionally. And Forster resigned as chief secretary. He was replaced not as some anticipated by Chamberlain himself, but by the financial secretary, Lord Frederick Cavendish, who caught the next train to Dublin and on arrival was stabbed to death in Phoenix Park by a murder gang. His place was filled after an offer to Dilk by Sir George Trevelyan. The government instantly reverting to coercion introduced a drastic crimes bill the day after Lord Frederick's funeral to be followed by an arrears bill. An amazing and still unexplained scene took place in the House of Commons on the 15th of May. When Gladstone declined to answer an Ulster member's demand to see the document or documents on the intentions of the recently imprisoned members of this house with reference to their conduct if released from custody, Parnell rose and proceeded to read the Kilmainham letter. Immediately Foster challenged its completeness. Parnell replied that he did not keep a copy of the letter in question, but that O'Shea had furnished him with a copy and it could be that one paragraph has been omitted. O'Shea rose to make an explanation, but when he announced that I have not the document with me and am therefore unable to read it, Forster thrust his own copy into his hands and forced him to read it. The letter as read by Parnell indicated that if the arrears questions could be settled upon the lines indicated by us, I have every confidence a confidence shared by my colleague, i.e. the other detainees, that the exertions which we should be able to make strenuously and unremittingly would be effective in stopping outrages and intimidation of all kinds. It went on to say that the accomplishment of the programme of permanent legislation of an ameliorative character would, in my judgment, be regarded by the country as a practical settlement of the land question. And I believe the government, at the end of this session, would feel themselves thoroughly justified in dispensing with further coercive measures. It was into this last sentence that the version reluctantly read by O'Shea introduced the startling clause, Would, I feel sure, enable us to cooperate cordially for the future with the Liberal Party in forwarding Liberal principles. Inextricable. Confusion followed over the next 48 hours. In the course of it, Forster disclosed O'Shea's communications with Chamberlain and himself, including a memorandum of their conversations. O'Shea astonishingly declared that he had written to Parnell his impressions of the debate on the 26th of April. It was a land bill, introduced by Irish MPs themselves, and that in reply, his honourable friend wrote him the letter, dated Kilmainham, 28th of April, which was read to the House. And Chamberlain admitted that O'Shea had mentioned something about leaving a sentence out, but that it had seemed to him unimportant and he had forgotten it. The only thing that is reasonably clear is that O'Shea, whom of course Parnell could not disavow without serving, severing his connection with Mrs. O'Shea, had double-crossed everybody and that nobody emerged with any credit. Any solution or message of peace to the Irish people was blown to the winds. However much Chamberlain might feel sure that England and Scotland would like a non-Irish session if we can keep the Irish quiet by fair words for the future, two reforms in Great Britain were already beginning to cast their shadows as far as Ireland. The extension of the franchise and democratic local government. Since a similar extension could scarcely be withheld from Ireland, a large reinforcement of the nationalist contingent was to be expected in any future parliament and both Chamberlain and the Prime Minister were disposed to see something more than county councils, as previously in agrarian reform, the key to that problem which the extended franchise would aggravate. 
However, these matters remained in abeyance. Though Gladstone privately ruminated on some fundamental change in the legislative relation of the two countries. Until, in the session of 1884, the motion to exclude Ireland from the Third Reform Bill was defeated, and the Concordat of the Autumn ensured that the bill would pass and the number of nationalist votes in an overrepresented Ireland would be trebled. Something would need to be done, or at least commenced in 1885, when the Crimes Act of 1882 was due to expire. Untaught by their experience 18 months earlier, O'Shea and Chamberlain had frequent interviews in the autumn of 1884, and O'Shea implied that Parnell, Parnell would consider a deal accepting minimum coercion in return for maximum local government. On 17th of December 1884, Chamberlain addressed an injudiciously speculative letter to one Duignan, an Irish liberal supporter in Walsall. I can never consent, he wrote, to regard Ireland as a separate people with the inherent rights of an absolutely independent community. On the other hand, he would be willing to go further than county government and transfer the consideration and solution of questions such as education and land which require local and exceptional treatment in Ireland and which cannot be dealt with to the satisfaction of the Irish people by an imperial parliament entirely to an Irish board altogether, independent of English government influence, which might also deal with railways and other communications and would, of course, be invested with powers of taxation in Ireland for these strictly Irish purposes. This was home rule with a vengeance. Not surprisingly, it soon leaked and began to find its way back to Gladstone and Chamberlain, first in January 1885, as a set of proposals represented uh, as emanating from Parnell as his price for 20, for 80 votes, I beg your pardon, for 80 votes in a future parliament, if combined with an emasculated renewal of the Crimes Act, and later in April 1885, as regarded by Cardinal Manning and the Irish bishops as satisfying all reasonable and just demands. It is curious that in setting himself with the Dilk to sell this to a cabinet where only Gladstone was favourably disposed, Chamberlain appears to have become, for the time being, oblivious to the question of parliamentary representation, which, as the guarantee of his postulated integrity of the empire, had he had already seen led to a federal United Kingdom. One cannot escape a suspicion that he was content to suppress this crux. In his letter to Duignan, he wrote of his proposals as more congenial than that of bullying English officials to the English House of Commons, while the Imperial Parliament would continue to regulate for the common good the national policy of the three kingdoms. The italics, which here are denoted to the three kingdoms, are, are pals. But the logic is Chamberlain's. What such an imperial parliament might be like must already have been in his mind, when in the autumn of 1880 he and Bright were the only cabinet ministers to support Gladstone's proposal to create grand committees for England, Ireland and Scotland. Parnell too provided the counterpoint when he asserted, We cannot, under the British constitution, ask for more than the restitution of Grattan's parliament, but no man has the right to fix the boundary of the march of a nation. The cabinet proved obdurate. Its disagreement was sealed by Gladstone's announcement on the 15th of May 1885 of the intention to renew coercion without proceeding at the same time either to a local government or a land purchase measure, and then on the 20th of May that there would be a land purchase bill after all, but financed for one year only. Dilk resigned without waiting for Chamberlain, and Chamberlain fulfilled their compact by following suit. But while the resignations remained in suspicion, the defeat of the finance bill in the early hours of 9th of June ended the government's life. Parnell had taken 40 of his followers into the Conservative lobby, and 76 Liberals had failed to vote. Gladstone pronounced both epilogue and prologue when he told Hartington he was firmly convinced that on local government for Ireland, Chamberlain and Dilk hold a winning position. You will all, I am convinced, have to give what they recommend. At the least, what they recommend. In July, the last item of the unauthorised radical programme was published in the National Review. Largely the work of a Dublin solicitor, George Fottrell, it was entitled 
local government and Ireland, and comprised a scheme of national councils for each constituent nation of the United Kingdom. Federation was back. Chapter 6. The Hinge. Unmuzzled by the breakup of the government, Chamberlain pronounced in a series of speeches in June July 1885 that the message of local government and devolution now coupled explicitly with home rule all round. I am ready, as he wrote on the 11th of June, I am already contemplating a campaign to be opened in Scotland in favour of my proposals for local government and the settlement of the Irish question. They will appreciate the arguments by which I shall justify its application to Scotland, as well as to other portions of the United Kingdom. In pursuance of the scheme, Chamberlain and Dilk planned an Irish tour. The rebuff which they received from Parnell's paper, United Ireland, and from Roman hierarchy, opened their eyes to what they should not have needed telling. Though the Conservative government of Lord Salisbury was only a brief caretaker, it declined to enact the Liberal coercion measure, and under Lord Randolph Churchill's influence, showed an open mind towards the ideas of devolution which had been canvassed. Not only were the Conservatives the government in being, Parnell paid a private call to the new Lord Lieutenant Carnarvon, but who knew but, the, but that the influence of the now reinforced nationalists during the election and 80 nationalist members after it might put a captive Conservative government into office and exact from it a more extensive home rule than Chamberlain had ever been prepared to contemplate. Chamberlain and Dilk were out on a limb and the matter had to be settled one way or another before the coming election. It was May 1882 all over again. On 11th of July, Chamberlain demanded through O'Shea a full and frank reply from Parnell, intimating that I believe that the next election will in any case give a majority to the Liberal Party independently of any Irish support, and if offer were now made on behalf of the English radicals is rejected, I cannot see any light in the future. Parnell's silence was the eloquent reply. On 29th of July, O'Shea conveyed to him Chamberlain's message that the Liberal leaders who had adopted your proposal to them and who had run much risk in promoting the adoption of it must now drop it from the programme. In the interval between the two communications had occurred the accusation of adultery which destroyed Dilk. Chamberlain would fight the election alone on the unauthorised programme. The long, drawn-out nationwide pre-election campaign speeches opened for Chamberlain at Hull at the beginning of August and ended at Birmingham in the latter part of October. Early in the course of it, the rupture between the Irish nationalists and the radicals was publicly declared by blow and counter-blow exchanged between Parnell, who had at Dublin on the 24th of August declared for national independence, and Chamberlain, who at Warrington on 8th of September denied the nationhood of Ireland and reaffirmed his federalist thesis. I cannot admit that five millions of Irish men have any greater inherent right to govern themselves without regard to the rest of the United Kingdom than the five million inhabitants of the metropolis. I, for my part, would concede the greatest measure of local government to the Irish people as I would concede it to the English and Scotch. Chamberlain proved to be mistaken in his anticipation of the outcome of the election, in which polling began on the 24th of November. By early December it was clear that the Liberals would have exactly as many seats as the Conservatives and Home Rulers combined. The result owed something to the fact that at the crucial moment, on the 21st of November, Parnell had thrown the weight of his influence against the Liberals by calling on Irish electors in his Great Britain to vote them out. On the other hand, the outcome of the election weakened Chamberlain's personal position, temporarily at least, because the unauthorised programme appeared signally to have failed to bring home the bacon. The Liberals, said the Times on the 26th of November, have to thank Mr Chamberlain, not only for their defeat at the polls, but for the irremediable disruption and hopeless disorganisation of the party. And it was in vain that Chamberlain, in a speech at Leicester on 3rd December, claimed that the losses had occurred because the election had not been fought on his programme. Given the normally superior whipping of a government party, and the imperfect attendance of Irish MPs. The result meant that, if they turned out Salisbury caretaker government, the Liberals would be able to govern, but only on a knife edge. 
constant peril of losing the majority on any occasion when the Conservatives and Home Rulers made a special and united effort, and faced with an intensification of the novel and little understood experience of systematic parliamentary obstruction. As Chamberlain had made it plain in his campaign that he would not enter a Liberal government uncommitted to free schools, graduated taxation, and compulsory acquisition of land by local authorities for allotments and small holdings, so he had resolved not to enter into competition for Mr Parnell's support on his terms for a separate and independent parliament, as he stated at Warrington. But he was not the only one to have decided what to do if the Liberals could govern only with Parnell's support. Already in the summer, Gladstone had been in tentative contact through his son Herbert and through Mrs O'Shea with the elusive Parnell. If he needed Parnell's support, it would cost much more than Chamberlain's limit. It would be the whole Parnellite hog. In the autumn, after the strange episode of a Chamberlain visit at Howarden, he was telling Chamberlain that uh, an instinct blindly impresses me with the likelihood that Ireland may should shoulder aside everything else. Chamberlain was still blinkered by his conviction of a liberal majority, and he could only hark back to his National Council's plan and opine that the only chance is to let the Irishmen stew in their juice, and that if we have a good majority it may be possible to divide them and secure support for our proposals. The grand old man's instinct now turned out to have been right. Chamberlain's hopes were cobwebs. The alternatives were either to leave the Conservatives to compromise themselves with Parnell, if so minded, and then when the Conservatives fell and the Liberals had to replace them to struggle along and aid it, but with increasing procedural protection against obstruction. Or else to govern with Parnell, on Parnell's terms. Gladstone was forced for the second course. And a press leak from Herbert on the 17th of December informed the country that with safeguards for the unity of the Empire, the authority of the Crown and the supremacy of the Imperial Parliament, his father was prepared to take office with a view to the creation of an Irish Parliament to be entrusted with the management of all legislative and administrative affairs, securities being taken for the representation of minorities and for an equitable partition of all imperial charges. Gladstone might announce that the statement is not an accurate representation of my views and is, I presume, a speculation upon them. But from that moment on, there could be no substantial doubt of Gladstone's mind, and nothing could ever again be as it had been. It would be surprising if Gladstone, faced with the prospect, not for the last time, of governing with Irish votes, had noted the consequences of a form of home rule so drastic as to eliminate Irish representatives from Westminster. In Great Britain alone, the Liberal Party still had a heavy majority. This may have been among the motives which led Gladstone to frame the legislation initially upon the basis, logically indefensible, if the Union was to continue at all, that there would be no Irish MPs in the House of Commons. For the moment, unlike Hartington, who on the 21st of December publicly came out against Home Rule, Chamberlain lay low, but in private letters over Christmas he made his unchanged position clear to old radical associates, such as La Boucher and Morley, who were rallying to Howarden. Home rule, except in a federal frame, was separation. There is only one way of giving bona fide home rule, which is the adoption of the American Constitution. 1. Separate legislature for England, Scotland, Wales, and possibly Ulster. The three other Irish provinces might combine. 2. Imperial legislature at Westminster for foreign and colonial affairs. Army, Navy, Post Office and Customs. 3. A Supreme Court to arbitrate on respective limits of authority. There is a scheme for you. It is the only one which is compatible with any sort of imperial unity, and once established, it might work without friction. Or again to Morley, I do not believe that there is anything between national councils and separation. He was even prepared to contemplate actual separation rather than the ambiguous worst of all worlds. If we are to give way, it must be by getting rid of Ireland altogether and by some such scheme as this. Call Ireland a protected state? England's authority to be confined exclusively to the measures necessary to secure Ireland and to secure that Ireland shall not be a point d'appui for a foreign country? The worst of all plans would be one in which kept the Irishmen at Westminster while they had their own parliament in Dublin. 
Lord Salisbury's government met the new parliament on the 21st of January with the Queen's speech containing a slap in the face to Parnell. I have seen with deep sorrow the renewal of the attempt to excite the people of Ireland to hostility against the legislative union between that country and Great Britain. I am resolutely opposed to any disturbance of that fundamental law, and in resisting it I am convinced that I shall be heartily supported by my Parliament and my people. As if that were not enough, the speech went on to foreshadow a new coercion bill, which followed promptly on the 26th of January, while the address was still being debated. That settled the matter. The government were turned out the same day on an amendment to the address dealing not with Ireland, but advisedly with allotments and small holdings. In the division, the nationalists, of course, voted against the government. But several eminent liberals, among them Hartington, supported it against their own party. Within a few days, Gladstone, having the Queen's Commission, was offering Chamberlain a seat in the Cabinet to which Hartington would not belong. Offered the Admiralty, Chamberlain preferred, significantly, the colonies, but settled for the local government, not without a kind of written treaty between Gladstone and himself. On his part, Gladstone foreshadowed an intention to examine whether it is practicable to comply with the desire widely prevalent in Ireland for the establishment by statute of a legislative body to sit in Dublin and to deal with the Irish as distinct from imperial affairs in such a manner as to be just to each of the three kingdoms. On his side, Chamberlain promised, promised to give unprejudiced consideration to any proposals that may be made, while being assured of unlimited liberty of judgment and rejection of any scheme that may ultimately be proposed. Chamberlain prompted, promptly busied himself with a local government bill to create county, district and parish councils, with powers of licensing, land acquisition and administration of local charities, and at Gladstone's request he circulated in the middle of February a scheme for Irish land purchase administered by an elected central board. It was a different land bill, involving £120 million to buy out the landowners which Gladstone at last placed before the Cabinet on Saturday 13th of March. Chamberlain immediately asked what form of authority was envisaged as guaranteeing the repayment, and with, when Gladstone referred to a separate parliament with full powers to deal with all Irish affairs, Chamberlain sent in his resignation, but was persuaded to withhold it in anticipation of the details of the Home Rule Bill, inquiring through Harcourt whether it was possible to discuss the matter on the basis of four bodies resembling the state's governments in the United States. It was still the federal solution to which... Chamberlain, as before and afterwards, consistently recurred. The temptation to interpret as a dialectical ad absurdum is almost overpowering, but must be resisted. There is nothing in anything which Chamberlain said or wrote, and he was candid to a fault, that suggests he so regarded it or that it was interpreted by any of those to whom the preposition was addressed. The fact has to be faced that in the penultimate decade of the last century, a federal Britain, or British Empire, appeared at least arguable, uh, not to say practicable. Britain had created federal states in Canada and Australia, and the case of America was ever-present. But it is difficult to resist the suspicion that the federal empires of the continent, above all the German Reich of 1871, had worked deeply, if silently, on the minds of British politicians. The idea was to play a large part in Chamberlain's subsequent life. The final break came when Gladstone's declaration to the Cabinet and Chamberlain's cross-questioning on the 26th of March. By a fortunate chance, A.J. Balfour recorded a dinner conversation with Chamberlain on the eve of that Cabinet, which reveals how he foresaw the, electoral, the ele electoral revolution that must follow if Gladstone failed to carry the Home Rule Bill. Whether we like it or not, said Chamberlain, the Tories are in a minority in the country. And it is only by the help of the radicals that anything material can be done. The condition of it being done successfully is that the whole affair should not be supposed to be a Tory Whig manoeuvre. To the view that at this moment, if you were to poll the northern counties, you would find a majority of home rulers. Which seemed to Balfour a prospect dark indeed. Chamberlain rejoined most characteristically that part of my democratic faith is that if a scheme is truly absurd, and unless we are all in a dream the scheme is so, people can be made to understand its absurdity. 
The Alliance would, if Chamberlain could have it so, be with the Tories, and not the Whigs. The Tory policy I understand with regard to Ireland. The Tories go in for coercion. I believe that it could create, could be carried out consistently for five years. It would succeed. No wonder that Balfour reported to his uncle, Lord Salisbury, that we shall find in Chamberlain, so long as he agrees with us, a very different kind of ally from the lukewarm and slippery Whig, whom it is so difficult to differ from and so impossible to act with.